Good morning. Um, she said, my name is Eric Winston. I'm from Durham, North Carolina. And I represent Raise Up the Fight for 15. All right. Yes, sir. Um, I had to, the pleasure of meeting this young lady in St. Louis. And the impact that she had on my life since then has been amazing. Um, the work she's done around the country is amazing. It just inspired me to go back and to work harder in my community. All right. She stands for the, the little people that can't speak for themselves. Mm. And she gave me the power to go back and to speak for people who scared to speak for themselves. And um, this lady is amazing. She does wonderful work. And with all this being said, I'm gonna cut through all the pleasantries and introduce Miss Mary Kay Henry. Thank you so much to my brother Eric. He is an inspiration uh, to me. I'm gonna tell you. Uh, my story of how I met him uh, in a bit, but I just want to begin by telling each and every one of you in this room how completely blessed I feel to be in your presence. The North Carolina NAACP has committed itself to being the foundation of the broadest movement we need to gather the forces of good and light against the forces of darkness and sisters and brothers together, we are gonna prevail. <laughs> um, and I just wanna say that um, the people that have come before me on this panel this morning it represent to me a way to honor the incredible work of this state organization. Uh, your labor chair, Mrs. Joyce Johnson, we stand on your shoulders of leadership in this state and across this country. I think Joyce embodies the fusion between a deep understanding about how the fight for racial justice and the fight for in, uh, economic justice are inextricably linked. That's right. And that when we fight for voting rights, we're fighting for labor rights and the rights of all people to win on every issue that the NAACP is standing up for. And to Apostle um, Edward Allen, I want to thank you uh, for praying for my grace. Um, I consider the ministry that I do each and every day an expression of God's grace, and I receive uh, your blessing with uh, total humility. And to uh, Reverend Nelson Johnson, who's had a huge impact on SEIU over the years, I think what he did was name the purpose of our breakfast, and I'm glad to be a voice in it, which is affirming the sacredness of work. And SEIU members each and every day commit ourselves to making sure that what we do is leave this world a better and more equal place for the next generation. And I want to thank Reverend uh, Nelson Johnson for his leadership. Thank you so much. <clears throat> And then I want you to know that Raise Up 15 sees the NAACP state chapter as uh, the birthplace of our movement in this state. It would not have been possible for Raise Up 15 to do what we've done in North Carolina without the incredible support and leadership of every state chapter district leader. And I just want to lift up Mr. Jerry McCombs and your leadership in District 4 because Jerry's leadership in supporting the Raise Up 15 leaders is the um, way I want to celebrate how much the NAACP in North Carolina is the heart and soul of the new movement in this country that needs to go national, and we're committed to taking it national with you. Uh, and to my brothers and sisters in the labor movement, uh, we are in this together with the NAACP, and I'm delighted that so many parts of the labor movement are here in this room this morning. Since our movements are so inextricably linked, I just wanted to tell you a short story of what informs my leadership. Um, I was born uh, as the oldest daughter in a family of 10 children. And every night, 
my mom gathered us to pray. And I learned stories about getting water from a stone and having 10 loaves and fishes feed thousands. And I was one of these children that made it a little tough on my mom. Because uh, I kept wondering how in the world that could happen. And she would remind me every night in her quiet, patient way, you need to have faith. And then I got a chance to do things with nine brothers and sisters. And I learned the power of people moving in a group could make anything happen. And so between my mother and my experience with my brothers and sisters, I am infused with an unshakable belief that when we can move together in a group that's powerful enough, there's nothing that we can't change. That's right. <laughs> and I learned this when um, Reverend Barber welcomed me at the fast food workers uh, convention that he attended. And um, he had gathered all the faith leaders up in the front of the room. And I was standing in the back of the room. And he saw me and he said, Mary, get up here. Um, you're a leader of faith, too. And I think that's what we have to do in this moment in the American labor movement, is we have to lead out of a faith that in spite of the unprecedented attack on everything we hold dear, that together we are going to make the impossible possible. Or as Reverend Barber said, that we're going to fight for and pray for and ask God to grant the gift of dreaming afresh and anew, dreaming God's dreams. And I thought to myself when I read that, I thought, well, that's what my mom taught me. And I just have a different way of talking about it. But the gift of the North Carolina NAACP is that you are helping us develop a language that shows that we are all fighting for a vision for justice, whether we call it dreaming God's dreams or a fight for a just society or a journey to justice. We are all on a path together and determined uh, to unite our fights. So in the way we talk about it in SEIU is that we share a belief that all work has value, mm -hmm. that every human being should be respected. Yeah. Yes. And this is when our members decided it was insufficient for us to worry about our wages, hours, and working conditions if we weren't having a fight for every family member and community member that was being disrespected. <laughs> and that meant that the labor movement needed to join arms with organizations like the North Carolina NAACP and fight for a uh, vision of society where all families and communities get a chance to thrive in this nation. And Reverend Barber's dream vision that you've all helped create together and have fueled with unprecedented protest movements for the last nine years in this state of economic sustainability, jobs and labor rights, educational equity, health care for all, including protecting the environment, protecting and expanding voting rights, and helping people understand that that voting rights fight is linked to a labor rights fight, because we have to elect public officials that are going to expand the voices uh, for working people and that it's rooted in our deep commitment to once and for all in this nation eliminating racial discrimination and racial hate hatred yes. and that we are on this journey to justice together where everyone can thrive. But sisters and brothers, I'm here in North Carolina and I don't need to list the threats to that vision. You are on the front lines of the threats with the Coke Pope machine that is generating uh, your threats. Um, we talk about it as a series of court cases and billionaire uh, schemes that elect public officials that rewrite the rules in the favor of the billionaires and the corporate agenda. And you know that it's not by accident that um, we have an economic system in this country that was born out of a decision to use enslaved Africans in order to create an economic system that has been in a struggle since that time to protect the wealthy few. And that our understanding in the labor movement about how that uh, de decision by our nation 
has to be a twin fight between the labor movement and a, the moral Monday and moral fusion movement that we commit in SEIU to making crystal clear to all of our members of every race why we need to commit the resources of our organization to unite with the NAACP and end the structural racism in this country once and for all. Our members of every race know that low wages are being experienced in every community in this country and that the corporate agenda that has driven down wages for 64 million people in this country who are earning less than $15, 64 million people in service and care work that should be valued and never has been valued because of racial exclusion. We know that we have to help our members across this nation understand why these fights are linked. And it's no accident that in North Carolina and the South, the roots of keeping this system in place also meant that unions were excluded from being able to form in the South because workers being able to come together threatened the existence of the Jim Crow system, the race, that, and so we understand that these fights have to be wage together. And it's no accident that the North Carolina legislature not only resisted wage, raising the minimum wage, they also eliminated the earned income tax credit for people earning low wages. It's no accident that this is the last state to have a law that directly denies government and municipal workers from unionizing. It's no accident that North Carolina has the lowest union strength in the country. But sisters and brothers, together we're going to raise up North Carolina <laughs> by uniting the heroes and heroines of this movement because nothing is going to stand in the way of us taking on the extremists. And you, sisters and brothers, the North Carolina NAACP have been at the heart and soul of a movement that has inspired a nation to believe that when we act together, we can shame them and show them that nothing is going to defeat our spirit and that we are required to build a robust North Carolina NAACP and raise up 15 to turn things around. You've been a force for standing up since the beginning of time. Jim Crow South, where black people lost their lives because they just wanted a voice and to be treated as whole human beings. And labor leaders and civil rights leaders have a history of standing together from Reverend King being joined by the Walter Ruther from the UAW in the Selma March and from Reverend King joining AFSCME sanitation workers in Memphis. Our movements are intertwined. And you have demonstrated that because the NAACP is the reason the Fight for 15 movement has taken root here in North Carolina and you have allowed us to work with leadership in this state to help us reach to Alabama and Georgia and to Florida. And we are so grateful that the North Carolina NAACP is committed to building here in this state, but using your courageous leadership to inspire people all across the South and the nation. Reverend Barber has been our moral voice in the fight for 15. He's made a huge difference. The NAACP leaders, I don't know how many of you in this room have stood with us on every strike since August 2013 when the campaign started in North Carolina. And on Wednesday night this week, we worked together in Raleigh at a wage board event at the General Assembly. The state, the state legislature doesn't want to pass the minimum wage. We're going to make a demand that they create a wage board to raise up raises for uh, fast food workers. And we celebrate with you today, I think I'm joined by fast food leaders, home care leaders, and child care leaders at these two tables who have been marching alongside with you at the Moral Mondays movement. Uh, and 1199 health care workers have joined you in these Moral Monday uh, movements. And I'm so proud that you are shining a light 
and standing up against the fossil fuel industry here in North Carolina, pushing back against fracking and uh, coal ash containment. You are teaching us about how to unite the fights across the justice movement to create an unstoppable force for change. You're leading the fight against a monster, a monster voter suppression bill, and you've led demonstrations against HB 318 and the most restrictive anti-immigration bill in the nation regarding sanctuary cities. The NAACP of North Carolina is a growing, vibrant organization that is home to every justice fight in our nation, and we are incredibly grateful to you. I'm inspired by each of you, and I'm inspired by heroes like Eric Winston, who I had the honor of being introduced by. I met Eric in a group of leaders earlier this year, I think in March, when we met together at Chapel Hill. We had home care workers, child care workers, adjunct professors from five universities in North Carolina, and fast food leaders around a table. And we all introduced ourselves about why are we in this fight. And Eric provoked one of the most powerful conversations I've had the privilege of being a part of. When he stood up and said, the only job I could get when I was released from prison was at Waffle House. Because Waffle House was the only place where I didn't have to check a box. But it means that I have to settle for pay that doesn't feed my family because of the exclusion of people like me around this state. And sisters and brothers, out of the 25 people in the room, six others raised their hand who were in the same situation. And so this for us is why the story of Raise Up 15 is not simply about $15 in a union. It's a fight to change everything that's wrong in our nation. And we're so proud to be in it with you. And thanks to Eric for his leadership. The story of our movement that is intersecting with you began three years ago in New York City when 200 workers decided bravely to do the most bodacious thing, just like the shoulders that we stand on of the Wilmington brothers and sisters who did a very bodacious thing, and hit things that were throughout North Carolina history. And they made what was considered then a ridiculous demand. $15 for a fast food worker? The leaders of that strike would be pulled off to the side by press and ridiculed just as the janitors were in our union 90 years ago who were told, you're not really a worker, you're nothing more than a servant. You don't really deserve a voice. So we stand on the shoulders of many people who have dared to demand their dignity and respect. And now three years later, 600,000 people in Los Angeles are on their way to $15 an hour. And 100,000 people in Seattle are on their way. 11 million people in this country have gotten a wage increase because there was the courage and fearlessness of workers all across this country who got into the streets and said, we deserve better. Enough is enough. McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King are earning record profits. A trillion dollars of our tax money is being used to subsidize these low wages because people can't feed their families or house themselves without public assistance. People don't want public assistance, but need to be paid what they are worth, and the companies need to invest their share of the profits in order to raise these wages so we can raise up every community in this country. And now, I was proud two weeks ago to stand with New York fast food workers who have been ordered by a labor wage board in that state that Andrew Cuomo, the governor, accepted. They are going to get a $2 an hour raise this December 1st, and then $2 after that, and $2 after that. 180,000 workers are getting raises. And so, brothers and sisters, together we are building a powerful movement that doesn't just have a dream vision. 
We're making that dream a reality in places around the country and creating enough pressure where even in Greensboro, North Carolina, there was a minimum wage increase that you should be incredibly proud of. Um, and we're going to escalate this fight in your labor uh, packets. There is a November 10th call to action that the North Carolina NAACP is helping us fuel. We will be in 260 cities around the U.S. because working moms and dads are joining together and speaking out and saying to elected officials and anybody running for office, we need to raise wages in this country and kickstart the economy. We want the presidential candidates to speak to how workers can form unions again on a scale that will help create a powerful force for change. We hope that we'll be together in the streets on November 10th as we stand to call the politicians out and to shine a light on their extremism. But sisters and brothers, what I want to do in closing is imagine with you, as we build this powerful force for change, what can be possible not just for ourselves, but for our children and our grandchildren. You and I both know the thing that unites us is a burning desire to make sure that we leave this world a better place for our children. And let us imagine when McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King have the sense to sit down at a national bargaining table right. with four million fast right. food workers and acknowledge that they have a right to a union right. and a voice on the job and to stand up not just for their pay but for schedules and health and safety and that they want to join uh, hands and make sure that we can continue to fight for voting rights and to make sure people are included. They'll be then joined by two million home care workers who can get recognized and have good pay and good jobs so we can make sure elders have the dignity to stay at home and child care workers who need to be able to come out of poverty and be able to care for the children of the future and build a brain so that every child has equal access to opportunity when they enter our education system. Imagine the collective power of our movement when the five million votes that have been suppressed by extremist laws get rewritten so that five million people have a right to participate in our democracy again. Imagine the strength that we're going to have in this movement when we clean out the North Carolina state legislature and elect people <laughs> that represent the majority uh, in this state. Brothers and sisters, I agree with Reverend Johnson. This is a transitional moment, and this is our time, brothers and sisters. And I want you to join me in a chant that I heard from your president. Forward together. Not one step back. Forward together. Not one step back. Forward together. Not one step back. God bless you all. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you all very much. I believe we're going to win. What do y'all think? Yeah. Yes, yes. And I hope you have written down in your calendars, your iPads, or in your mind mostly, what's the date? November 10th. All right. I think we're going to hear a few words from our president, Dr. Barber. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good morning, early. Good morning, early. So what do y'all think about this preaching white woman? <laughs> We got all, that's why they're so mad with, with the NAACP and Marl Monday, because we got so many friends. And uh, I never will forget the day, the first day we went in to get arrested, Mary Kay, and I was holding the hand of Barbara Zelta. Barbara Zelta happens to be white and Jewish. And so I was holding the hand, David, and I heard one of the legislators say, let us say, say, I thought, I thought the NAACP was coming. What are all these white people doing with them? <laughs> and the problem is they don't even know history. Right. The, the founder of the NAACP looked like right. this. Right. The, first, the first president looked like Mary Kay. Right. Maybe it was your auntie or something. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> but the power, civil rights and labor yeah. has always been two focuses but one movement. 
The march on Washington was not about kumbaya. The, who, was, who was there? March on Washington. Raise your hand. We got some people that were actually there. The march on Washington was not about let's just even just get voting rights. It was about jobs and justice and freedom. Jobs and freedom. Always been connected. So when folk complain, like these groups say that uh, the NAACP and Reverend Barber is connected to the labor union, they try to use that as a fear tactic, we don't run from it. They're telling the truth. We have been, we are, and we always shall be connected to the issue of labor and civil rights. You cannot separate race and class in this country. That's right. They both have to stay united together if you're going to have transformational change. And we can, they've always bet in the South that they could pit white workers against black workers in the South. In the South. But we are believing, Nelson and Joyce and many of us, that that day is about over. Yeah. And Mar Monday and the fight for 15 is showing the way. Hmm? Now, what's interesting, Mary Kay, as you said, I want to tell you that, um, George, Mary Kay is crazy. Yeah, that's good. I mean, no, I mean literally, I, you, you know, because when I, I heard from people when she endorsed and embraced Raise Up 15, they said the same thing about you they said about Mar Monday. It won't work. You can't build a coalition. Because sometimes progressives talk themselves out of progress. Yeah. Because they get in a room and say what they need to do, and then they figure out all the reason they can't do it. Sometimes we do that in, our, in the NAACP. Yeah. We have a great speaker like last night about all we need to do, then we get in a business meeting and talk ourselves out of it. Yes. But I'm glad that she said, we're going to do this. Yes. And she understood that to empower many of these are young people in a movement was as important now as SNCC was yes. back in the 1960s. Yes. Because it has, it has helped to fuel more energy. And I'm thankful that Ben Wilkins is here, our good organizer and other members of Raise Up 15. I want you finally to know that the same people against living wage increases are against welfare. Now you can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. You can't be against, Bishop, people making money and then turn around when they need help because they're not making money, be against giving them help. You can't have it both ways. That's why this country was wrong when we said we took people off welfare, but we didn't put people in jobs. That's right. That's right. That's right. To end so-called welfare but not create living wage jobs is a form of hypocrisy. In fact, it's a form of cruelty, That's right. especially when you keep giving corporations welfare. Yeah. We also have to stand here like this, woman, man, black, white, because there is a racial side to the denial of living wages. You don't have McDonald's paying less than a living wage where they have uh, um, stores in predominantly white countries. Mm -hmm. Am I right? That's right? There are places where most of the fast food workers are white. They pay $20 an hour. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, the flip a hamburger. Uh -huh. So there's a racial element to this now. And, and, and as soon as white workers in the South and others realize this, we're going to have a powerful coalition. We're going to have a powerful coalition. Also, the same people against living wages who are against welfare are against voting rights. It's all connected. It's all connected. Finally, each branch, it's time for us, and we're going to be talking about, Joyce, I want to ask you as our labor chair to help lead this. Every branch going to your city council and demanding those city councils vote to raise the living wages in those municipalities. We're going to start that as a campaign. That's going to be our, our part of this. And we're going to be with you on, what, November the 10th? That's right. And uh, I don't know, I, I got because I have a pending case, but, you know, I ain't too much worried about that. So if, if the lawyers say that there's no problem with that and some people decide they want to uh, you know, do a little civil disobedience, I'm going to go with this fast food workers, man, and we're going to bring some other folk along with it. All right? Yeah. Al, y'all work, figure the legal stuff out. But we're going to stand with and I want some, now, now, now the NAACP, if some of y'all, I'm going to say, I want y'all to stop clapping and start going. All right. Huh? Uh, what, those of you that been, stand up. I want some of y'all to stop saying, go rev, 
and come go with Rev. Uh, come and go with me to the jailhouse. Don't be talking about go, go Rev. You, Rev hallelujah. No, you come go. Stop being scared. <laughs> and branches don't ever sell out. Don't ever let anybody shut your mouth. And then lastly this morning, um, um, I just want you to know, Mary Kay, how thankful we are. There are places this, this sister has stood and fought behind the scenes that you all don't even know about. Uh, places where we were being attacked. That's right. I know for a fact that during Moral Monday, there were forces telling her, do not stand with the NAACP. Mm -hmm. And she and, and Brother Gresham took a stand, took a stand. And I'm forever, ever indebted mm -hmm. and grateful uh, you. to you for taking that stand. So let's give our leader a great big hand. Let's stand on our feet and give her a great big hand. Great big hand. There is union in the struggle where I belong. Oh, I belong. Yes, I belong. Oh, there is union in the struggle where I belong. Oh, I belong to the union. No, oh, there is union in the struggle where. Struggle where I belong. I belong where I belong. Oh, there is union in the struggle where I belong. Yes, I belong to the union. That sounds good. Oh, there is union in the struggle where I belong. Where I belong. you 